Hello, my lovely students. So here's this week's bonus video. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do this indefinite integral, and then I'm going to go do the initial value problems. All right, so this one, kind of weird, because we got a little more going on in there. Uh, it's at x plus 2 squared, but it's on the bottom. So let's see if we can't uh, rewrite that a bit. So I've got 11 times x plus 2 to the negative 2. That's a little better. dx. So we've seen our antiderivative power rule, which can be written like this. But I want to introduce you guys to u substitution just in a very general sense. So the idea of u substitution is it's how we undo the chain rule, because I know that was kind of confusing people in class. So the way it works is I look at the thing that's ugly, and then I look at what the next innermost thing from the ugly is. So here, my negative 2 power is like the ugliest operational thing here. And part of what's making this ugly is because the inside isn't just x. It's more than x. So if I say, all right, I'm going to call that u. And then in this case, my derivative of that u is just dx. So we're kind of doing implicit differentiation here, marking what we're taking the derivative of. We just don't have a du dt or dx dt. It's just du and dx. But the derivative of x plus 2 is just 1, and then we're marking that it was an x derivative because we're going to change the variable in our formula here. So instead of seeing this as x plus 2 to the negative 2, we're going to see it as u to the negative term, but our integrand du and dx are perfectly equal, so it's a fair trade. All right, so that 11 is a constant. We can kick it outside the integral. So now I have the integral of a thing raised to a power, and the variable of integration is that same thing. So our u and our du matches. That's a big part of u substitution. So I think of this as like, beginner u substitution because du is the same as dx. Usually there's a little more, but here, nice. So this follows our power rule format because the whole x, dx, those can be replaced by any variable. So I'm going to apply my u substitution, my sorry, my power rule down here. So when I'm doing this add one and divide by its step, the integral goes away because doing this add one is doing the antiderivative. So we get u to the negative 2 plus 1 over negative 2 plus 1. And also, once the integral goes away, the du goes away with it. But this is the step where you want to start writing the plus c. So I used to kind of think of the integral symbol is like my do my antiderivative stuff, and then the du or dx turns into the plus c. Like I just needed to see some sort of equal trade. All right. So now we just need to go back to what u was. So this will be 11, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. So 11 divided by negative 1 is negative 11. And now instead of u, we go back to the x plus 2. And then the negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1 plus c. That is the antiderivative. That is the integral of what we were given. 
Now, if they wanted us to do an integral again, things would get really weird because negative one plus one is zero. We can't divide by zero. So something to the negative one power has a different antiderivative. It doesn't follow the power rule. It's the only case that doesn't. So there's like an extra caveat to our power rule up here that we often forget to write and talk about, but that special case is, oh, and can't be negative one. All right. Okay. So we did that first initial value problem. Now we're going to take a look at the next one, and then we'll do the double. And the double one is like a very classic setup from physics. Okay, so here, ds dt equals negative 12t plus cosine of t, and we know s of 0 equals negative 3. So notice the ds dt here, this is saying the derivative of the position function. So this is a velocity. Cool. All right, so if I want to do the antiderivative here, the ds over dt, like having the over dt is actually problematic because when we integrate, we need to know what we're integrating with respect to. So we actually need that dt on the other side. So our first step here is actually just going to be a little bit of rearrangement. And I'm only doing this because they went to the effort of writing the differential notation. So I have everything on the right side times dt. Now dt is a quantity that I could multiply through, um, but I don't have to. Next step would be to say, okay, now we're going to integrate. So on the left, the integral of ds is just s. Technically, there would be a plus c, but on the right side, we're also going to get a plus c, and we there isn't a way to distinguish between the two, so you just need one of them. That's a lesson learned from differential equations. So this left side will be our s function. And now we've got to think about our antiderivative. So negative 12t to the first, I can use my power rule there. So I'll have negative 12t to the 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 plus my antiderivative of cosine. Derivative of sine is cosine. So antiderivative of cosine, integral of cosine is sine. And then plus c. Now I'm going to clean this up a little, and then we'll use our initial value to actually find the value of c. So I'll go ahead back to the function notation. s of t is, so 1 plus 1 is 2. Negative 12 divided by 2 is negative 6. t squared plus the sine of t plus our constant. So now everywhere there's a t, because I'm doing s of 0, everywhere there's a t, I'm going to put a 0. So for now, since I like using my colors, I'm just going to leave a blank spot. And again, 6, negative 6 t squared, 0 squared, 0. The sine of 0. Sine is our graph that starts at the origin, so sine of 0 is 0. So we know s of 0 is negative 3. They defined that to be the case. And then on the right side, we get 0 plus 0 plus c, so we just get c. So we can now say our s of t function is negative 6 t squared plus the sine of t minus 3, because our constant ended up being negative 3. So there is our initial value problem done. We did our antiderivative the same way we were. Then we used the extra piece of information to figure out c. All right. And now we got our weird one, and this is actually going to address the, well, what the heck is the antiderivative of something with a negative one power? We'll see. Okay.
So first things first, though, this is our double prime of t. All right, so to find our single prime of t, I'm going to take the integral of 2 over t squared dt. So that can be rewritten as the 2 on the outside and t to the negative 2. So now we'll do our power rule. So r prime of t equals 2 times t to the negative 2 plus 1 divided by negative 2 plus 1, which is just negative 1. And then dt turns into plus c. It doesn't really, that's just the way my brain got it to stick so I'd remember to do plus c. All right, we can clean this up some. So this will be negative 2 t to the negative 1 plus c. Now I look back, they told me r prime of 1 is negative 2. So I'm going to take my r prime of t, and that's why they told us it was the derivative so we could solve for this c, and then we'll solve for the other one later. Sometimes, though, you actually just have to play around with the original function and solve for both of them from there, because that's what you had. Right, no t there equals negative 2 times blank to the negative 1 less c. So notice we don't get 0 as our starting value, because we had over t squared. 0 is not a good number for that. So a 1 and a 1. But 1 is like our other best friend. We just get the constant. So 1 to the negative 1, 1 over 1 is still just 1. And then they told us r of 1 is negative 2. Oh, sneaky, lazy bass people. So I have negative 2 equals negative 2 plus c. So if I add the 2 over, c is 0. So let's bring this up here. Our prime of t is just negative 2t to the negative 1. All right, now we got to think to ourselves about this as the derivative of something. So I want to think about what function that when I take the derivative of it, I get 1 over x. So I'm trying to think about who goes in here, who has that derivative. So it's really awkward to think through these things backwards, especially when you guys are first learning how to do this. So there is nothing wrong with going down and looking at the list of derivatives. All right, so I know it's not the trick, guys. Those are all gross. But we look here. Boom. There's our 1 over x. So we've got the ln of the absolute value of x. It's hit or miss whether they actually want you to write the absolute value symbols. Like generally something in the problem already constrains x to be positive, so we don't have to worry about it. But technically, it is there. Technically, we should also say and x can't be 0. So up here, our antiderivative... So this is now just r of t. We get the negative 2 as a constant multiple. And then t to the negative 1 is 1 over t. So this is the natural log, technically, of the absolute value of t. Plus, um, some people don't like to use the same variable again, because like we use c, we found c was 0. So we should call this other constant something else. Some people will do subscripts. Other people just use the next letter. Um, in this case, since we're not going to have a lot of them, I'm just going to use the D. But first, I'm going to make this 
smaller. But D is just some arbitrary constant. When you start working in differential equations, though, you just start using subscripts because sometimes you end up with a bunch. All right, now I go back and they told me, ah, R of, again, not zero, is also negative two. Wow, they just, well, here it's a little uglier. So we want to figure out R of one. That is negative two times the natural log of the absolute value of one plus D. So absolute value of one is one. Natural log, any log asks the base to what power equals what I'm taking the log of. So I want to think E to some power equals one. So let me kind of sidebar the thought process. So the power that takes any number, and when I have that as the power, I get one, that's the zero power. So the natural log of one here is zero. Times negative two is gonna be zero plus D equals, and then R of one was defined to be negative two. So now we can see that D is in fact negative two. So our final function here is negative 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of t minus 2. There it is. So we had two different constants, but we figured it out. We ran into one of the trickiest to remember antiderivatives just because we're going, like, doing the derivative, you guys have kind of gotten used to it. But thinking through it backwards is weirder because it's the one thing that looks like a power rule but won't follow the power rule. Because if you try to do the power rule, you'll divide by zero. So if you do ever like not see it at first and you start writing over negative one plus one, that's zero. That's when you like pause, rewind, divide by zero. Okay, this is not a power rule, which makes it natural log. But natural log is going to be like your bestest bud when it comes to derivatives. Like it shows up when it comes to antiderivatives. It shows up in all sorts of wacky places. All right. So antiderivative, it says essentially the opposite, meaning it's the inverse operation. Talks about the arbitrary plus C. Uh, another phrase for general antiderivative is indefinite integral. And then if we're given an initial value or some extra piece of information, we can use that to determine the value of C. Alrighty.